Our subject this morning, or the title of our subject, is God's Set Apart People. Our text will be a selection of different scriptures, and it's our custom to stand together while the scriptures are being read, and the scriptures are printed in your bullet. So let's stand together, please, and read the scripture. Everyone's welcome to read. Psalms chapter 4 and verse 3. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord has set his love upon you, the Lord chooses you, because of the Lord. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the land of the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people <coughs> of God, which hath not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Thank you. Be seated, please. God's set apart people. God has a people whom He has set apart for Himself. They are special to Him. He loves them with an everlasting love. He does many wonderful things for them. And the question before us is how are they set apart? What is the procedure in which God sets apart a people for His name? We will consider what God has made them and how He does it. How are God's people set apart to Himself? First of all, I have seven reasons or procedures that God uses to set apart a people for his namesake. First of all, they are set apart in unconditional election. John 15, 16, Jesus said, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. That's something that not many people understand, but that's what Jesus said, and that's what he meant. Now consider the time of election. In Ephesians chapter 1, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that's the time element, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, not ours, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, 
Brethren beloved of the Lord, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Unconditional election is biblical. Unconditional election is baptistic. And the reason it's unconditional is because God has not attached conditions to it that we have to fulfill in order to be saved. He has done all the work that needed to be done Himself. On the cross, Jesus, hanging between heaven and earth, dying for a people, said, Tetelestai, it is finished. Now you can't finish something you can't fin do something that's already finished. If He finished the work on the cross that needed to be done for our salvation, then there isn't anything left for us to do except to accept it and believe it. Election is God's act, not man's. Election is God's sovereign act, chapter 9 of Romans. Election is an act of sovereign grace. God chooses whom He will. Election took place before the foundation of the world. Now if election took place, if God chose us before the foundation of the world, it doesn't leave a whole lot for us to do, does it? It leaves nothing for us to do. Only a remnant are elected. Romans 11, 5. 2 Thessalonians 2.13, election was unto salvation. It wasn't a corporate election. It was a personal election. Election includes the preaching of the gospel as a means of saving and drawing out His people to Himself. All the elect will believe, Acts 13.48. Election guarantees the salvation of many, Romans 10, 20. The gospel is to be preached to all men everywhere, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So Jesus meant what he said when he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So these scriptures lay the foundation for what we believe as a people of God. When I look in the mirror every morning, I marvel that God would save a sinner like me. And I'm sure you should feel the same way. If you don't, you're not there yet. If you were there, you'd say, that's me too. I'm a sinner too. Well, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So God, back before He created the universe, before He hung the stars in space, before He adjusted the planets to their courses, knew us, loved us, and chose us for Himself. What a wonderful thing He did back yonder in eternity past, when we had not even been conceived in our mother's womb. We had not been brought into being. And yet He loved us. He knew us. And He determined to save us from our sins and to have us with Him in heaven as His people. Unconditional election is one of the purposes and one of the uses God makes to save sinners. He chooses them. And in this election, it is a personal choice of Himself to personal individuals. God doesn't save people in great crowds. He saves people one by one, individually. He loved you. He knew you. He sent His Son to die for you. That's what He means by unconditional election and personal election. The second thing that God does to save a sinner 
is to set him apart in the atoning death of Christ. Christ died for the people that he elected. And in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now, if you want to know who Jesus died for, here's your answer from Jesus himself. He giveth his life for the sheep. Well, who are the sheep? In John chapter 10 and verse 15, Jesus said, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Twice here, Jesus says, He lays His life down for the sheep. I had a person tell me one time, Well, everybody's a sheep. No, not everybody is a sheep. Some people are goats. Let me read it to you in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory and before Him shall be gathered all nations and He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then in verse 41 of Matthew 25, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So Jesus spoke about the fact that there's coming a day when He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And that's in the great judgment day. He knows who His sheep are and He knows those that are goats and He's going to separate them and He's going to gather His sheep into His own fold and the goats will be sent into eternal punishment for their sins. When Jesus died on the cross, he saw something. I'm going to read it to you from Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11. Where God says, He, Jesus, shall see the travail of His soul. He travailed upon the cross as a woman is in travail giving birth to a child. Jesus travailed upon the cross and it says, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. On the cross, I believe that Jesus saw in a panoramic vision, I believe it passed before his sight, every one of his elect sheep that he was dying for. One by one, they passed before him as he hung there on the cross. He saw them through the eye of divine omniscience. He knew them by divine omniscience. And as they passed before his face, he, knowing that they were his and that he was there on the cross, redeeming them from their iniquity, saving them from judgment. There he saw his people. And that's what Isaiah says in 53, 11. He shall see the travail of his soul. As he travailed upon the cross, he saw me. He saw you if you're a believer. He saw us. And he knew who he was dying for. He died for His elected people. Those that He chose before the foundation of the world. Those that hadn't even been born yet. He died for them. And He paid their debt that they could not pay. I have a plaque hanging in my office behind my desk. And I look at it every day. You know what it says? It says, 
Jesus paid the debt he didn't owe because I had a debt I couldn't pay. We were indebted to the justice of God. We have broken God's law. We're indebted to the law of God. We broke it. We broke the Ten Commandments. We're sinners. And we could not pay that debt. And that debt had to be paid. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death is what we deserve for breaking God's law. And yet on the cross, Jesus took that judgment upon Himself. In my place He died. In your place He died. If you're a believer, He died for you. And He paid your debt in full. He didn't leave out one sin to be atoned for. He knew every sin you ever would commit. And He died for all our sins. Colossians. And He saw the travail of His soul. He saw me. He saw you. Whose iniquities are these whom He set apart? His sheep. His sheep. If you read the 10th chapter of John, over and over again until it breaks upon your heart and mind. This is my shepherd. This is the one that rescued me when I was lost sheep. When I was out on the mountainside lost, couldn't find my way home, didn't know where to go or what to do, my sins rising like a mountain before my face, my shepherd came and found me. He put me on.